Hi, this is Gene Paul, back again. This time, it's got to do with the new sound. And of course, who mentioned something like that? Grandma. <laughs> she mentioned it to Dad. Dad went, whoops. And he knew that that was his next tangent, was going to be to go and find that. So he went back to California to his house and he cleaned out the garage and made it a studio, of course. <laughs> and anybody and everybody who came over to the house ended up in the studio. And he recorded a lot. And from that came the idea to take and do several parts himself. And he would, the only way he could do that at that time was vinyl to vinyl, record to record, that kind of thing. And he did it. And with more tangents, he came up with delays, echoes, all of these things, and, and started to get something he was really comfortable with, something he could submit to a label and see what they thought. And that's what he did, and he'll tell you the story coming up. The other thing is, is that I, as a kid, would hang out with dad and we get involved in stuff uh, and, and uh, whether it be uh, he's got a particular sound going on that he wants to try or uh, I'd be down in the basement winding coils for his guitar pickups and he'd put them in the guitar and uh, if he found something he really liked he'd take that guitar the next time on the road. Well. Lo and behold, I'm in the band, I'm on the road with them. And it was interesting because after a while I got my act together and I could really watch Dad and Mary. And Dad was a card because when he got in front of an audience, it was Jekyll and Hyde. He turned into something else. And, and it's funny because he, he mentioned to me one time, he said, when, when I get in front of an audience, I like to pick out somebody who is not convinced. And I say, what, do you, what do you mean by that? He says, I like to take and focus on that person, and by the end of the show, I want to see him loving it. And that's how I approach getting out there in front of the audience. Now, I know all the years I worked with them and was privy to be on the stage with them, and Mary did the same thing. She'd back up because he'd be going off on a tangent, <laughs> playing for somebody or doing something. And, and even times he'd, he'd be on the stage, he'd be talking more than he'd be playing <laughs> and telling his stories. But he, my point of this is he had a, a it had to be the biggest passion he had because making the guitar, making the records, making the echoes, making all of these things led up to one thing. And that's when the bell went off and he walked out on stage. That was his Jones. That was his moment. That was his everything he worked for. And that was his passion, being on that stage. The other thing is at the end of this video, I've got a little segment about one of his other things, and that was the eight track recorder, the multi-track recorder. Without it, we would be in bad shape. Today, technically, the multi-track is the key to recording. When you look back, at how he felt, how it influenced him, you'd be shocked to hear what his <laughs> quote was. I hope you enjoy this video.
first multiple recording is where you play a part and then you add a part to it and you're playing two parts, one person. I did with my mother's uh, player piano where I was punching the holes in it. Uh, the second one was with uh, two recording lathes where we'd record a, I'd record a record here, a guitar, and then play that record back and then record myself live with the record and then put it onto another record. That was the second way. And the third way is uh, where I added a fourth head to a mono tape machine. Then the idea hit me and I said, I know where it's at. It's to stack up this machine with all eight tracks. And by making an eight track machine, you can individually put one on one, two on two, three on three. I can record each part individually. Rumors are flying that you've got me sighing that I'm in a crazy kind of a daze, a lazy sort of a haze. My mother came to visit me in 1946 in Chicago. I was with the Andrews sisters. And she says, Lester, it's good to see you. I heard you last night on the radio. And I said, Mom, you couldn't have heard me. I'm on the stage here with the Andrews sisters. And she says, well, then you better do something about it because there's a lot of people copying you. And I thought about it. So I decided to go home. And I left the Andrew sisters in Chicago and decided to go back to Hollywood, lock myself in that garage until I get a sound that I'm looking for. What are you looking for? Well, I can't tell you I haven't found it yet. Les was one of the premier guitar players in the business. For him to spend this time in his garage to try to come up with this concept uh, was an amazing thing, you know. I mean, he, he could, could have lived very well without this, but this was something that was a dream. You go out and get some trumpets, you go out and get some violins, you can do anything. But I don't want the same sounds. I want sounds that have never been heard on Earth. I want new sounds. It's up here. It's way off the fretboard. He's played it up here. And then when it's sped up, it's it's like way up in the, uh, where only dogs can hear, you know? One day, I walked out the door, and right across the street is a sign being put up called Capitol Records. I backed up the stairs. And I see a sign that says, Jim Conklin, Vice President. And I says, well, my name is Les Paul. He says, the guitar player? I says, yeah. He says, geez, Les, I would love to hear, hear your record, but he says, I gotta run. And he says, I don't know how to run the record player anyway. I said, I know how to run the record player, and you're not packed yet. Let me play it until, until, until you're ready to go. So he said, okay, and I dropped the needle on Lover, and he says, my God, how many of these you got? I says, 21. He says, you got a deal. first time we heard that record, it was on the air, you know, and, and, uh, and it just was an instant hit. How did he do it? How do you do that? It revolutionized the business. We were all trying to figure out how we did it and how we were going to be able to accomplish things like that. It's like a, a big guitar orchestra. There's so many parts going on. There's the bass line, which is really critical, and then you have all of the top line. It's like a big band. It's the 
Les Paul Show. If you think you're hearing double during the next 15 minutes, why, you'll be perfectly right. And so, by way of warning, the program is electrified, multiplied, and transcribed, fresh out of a recording machine. And by way of music, here's that guitar man himself, Les Paul. I really had the foresight to see that instrumental, 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 all instrumentals, that it's gonna, I'm gonna run dry. And there are certain songs where the vocal is very important. And if it's a vocal song, I can't do it. Okay, so I need a vocalist. You are my sun, you shine, my only sun, you shine. You make me happy when skies are gray. So I walk out of NBC, and the guy says, hey, Rue Barber, and I turn around, it's Gene Autry. So I said, you're just the guy I'm looking for. I says, I'm looking for a gal. Gene says, I, I got a gal. They're all good, but the one in the center is a good looker. She's got an ear like a hawk. So I called Colleen Summers and, would you come over to my studios? And I'd like to hear you sing. You told me one year you really loved me That nothing else could come between Let's fall in love, why shouldn't we fall in love? Our hearts are made This is William Street. The uh, Northwestern Depot is on one side, and of course, our Club 400 is over here on this side. My dad and brother called and said they're opening a tavern, and it would be great if I could come to Waukesha. Les and Mary Ford came in and played for the first time together. And they played, which is where the jukebox is right now. singing and playing and in this little joint I saw it I said boy if I taught her the pop songs today and got her shine her up a little bit this is going to be great we might have been meant for each other my dad is shaking his head no to be or not to be let a heart discover I said dad it'll work no, he says, you're a roughneck. And she's a delicate gal. It'll never work. Let's fall in love. Just one more word change. The Germans came up with the first tape recorders during the war. And afterwards, when I saw the first machine, the idea struck me and I thought, geez, this would be a wonderful thing if we put another head on it. And we could record it and then re-record it, da 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 I went to Bing Crosby and I told Bing about it. So the next thing you know, Bing comes over to my house. And he says, hey, Les, I got something for you out in the car. Have fun. And he left. Well, I didn't have the machine an hour. In 49, I called the Ampex people and says, hey, I need another record head. We drilled the holes in there, mounted the head in there, and I said, Mary, say something. Hello. Hi, hello there. Hello, hello folks. Hi, hello there. Hello, folks. Both parts are on the tape machine. And at that time, just come out of an accident, I threw my crutch in the air and we danced. And we danced around the room. The invention was there. It had the first sound on sound tape machine. Bye, bye, blue. Bye, and I said, Mary, forget the laundry, forget everything. Lock the house up, we're leaving. We now can do what we do in the garage on the road. Just reach in the back of the car is a tape machine. I can record anywhere, a garage, a basement, a motel, it can be a film station. From room to room to room to room. And they would get these sounds. <laughs> 
I'd say that's the greatest bathroom in the world. The echo in that shower, I want to put you right here. I'd have certain things that I wanted Mary to do. I'd put a speaker on one end, a mic on the other, and I had my own echo chamber. Ooh-wah, ooh-wah. Oh, I love that. Where's the tiger? Yep, the tiger. Lost the tiger. Ain't seen the tiger. Where's the tiger? Look for the tiger. Lost the tiger. Has anybody seen the tiger? <laughs> It was a sound that no one had ever heard before, what we later learned was overdubbing. It took genius to know how to build this thing, layer on layer on layer on layer. I felt like I was on a racetrack most of the time when he played, because he played so fast. We made Tiger Rag, there were smoke rings there, we made just... Hit after hit after hit. There was nothing like it before, and there's been nothing like it since. And this is the way I live. I just say, well, maybe, maybe if it's to happen, it will happen. Nothing sounds like the records that those two made. You hear these sounds that you think are just commonplace. They're not. They all, they all emanate from that one place, Les Paul. It's a lot easier to do something once it's been done uh, than to be the first guy to do it, and he was the first guy to do it. It was just incredible sound, and uh, I just fell in love with the records that he made. They make music the way people have made music since the world began. First of all, they are musicians. They have an accurate ear for harmony. They work very hard. They have a lot of patience, and they take advantage of the trick which, granted, electronics makes possible. We play the first part on the guitar. So. Now you, you put your earphones on, and you play another part to it. Is that That's right? That's right. Now, I see. Uh... Got it? I get the idea now of the background. That's the background. You play this, all this to Mary, is that right? Or does she do it separately? Well, Mary will hear the part that's already made, and then she sings on to it. Somewhere there's music, how faint the tune. Somewhere there's heaven, how high the moon. Now I'll add a tenor part to that. You're on. Somewhere there's music, how faint the tune. Somewhere there's heaven, how high as soon as you press record, you have now both of them together, but you erase the first one. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, the third one, the fourth one. You're burning the bridges behind you because you cannot go back to the previous part and do it over. Sounds rather basic, but it, how you build that chord and the, the chords and the parts is critical. Yeah, that's it. I can tell it. It's got an intro that nobody else has. I used to play it many times. Many times. He did the guitars, Mary did the vocals. Not just sang them, she arranged them. That's great, tight, four-part harmony that she did. The phrasing is unbelievable. There it comes. Oh my gosh. Uh, tone. He's the chief of tone. There's a country influence in here, there's a jazz influence in here. Charlie Christians didn't have as good a tone as Les. Let's be serious, he's a, he's a great thumper on the guitar, and, he, and he's a great player, and we all love him but he didn't have that tone. Well, that right there is enough to scare another guitarist. This is just amazing. This is an amazing record today.
Oh, yeah. How many arms have held you? And it's pure. It's just pure. Boy, they were something else, weren't they? How many, how many, I wonder. But I really don't want to know. Like a little girl, how feeling her way. Many, oh my God, I was great. It's recorded so beautifully, too. And set your soul aglow. She didn't bend the note. She just hits it, stays with it. Oh, if you don't bend them now, you got no style. <laughs> he's giving up his talent to make her look good. And he's playing just at the right time. Whenever there's an opening, he'll play a little lick. But in the meantime, she has a foundation to sing with that's very comfortable. And she can stay her natural self. There's an art to that. Da, 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 da. Murray's voice was the most smooth, sweetest. She, even when she belted out a song, it was sweet. Is waiting for the sunrise in my heart is called. If you love somebody, you're sharing this thing with somebody, creating. It's a dream to find a partner like I found. Get out of here, man. He would have had to make up multi-tracking for this. I mean, that to me, the greatest thing invented multi-tracking. We couldn't have records without it. I couldn't write music without it because that makes it twice as much fun to be able to play with yourself part an expression. <laughs> I'm learning so many licks here. <laughs> Wow. See, it's like it's like horns there. And every phrase is every phrase is a winner, and every phrase is memorable. And therein lies his genius. His, his creativity is just like nobody else. There were so many things happening, and so decided right off the bat that we're going to build a studio. So we'll build one first. So we built this one first. We used for television and radio, but never used to record in. We never recorded anything in here. In fact, never recorded anything other than the sound on sound. Of all the hits we ever made, none were ever made on a multi-track machine. The most fun we had was sound on sound. And it was the most difficult way of recording. But when we moved here into this studio, I wasn't here. It was a matter of weeks. That was in 53. And the idea struck me to make a multi-track machine. So I went to West Trex. West Trex turned it down. I was going to have sprocketed tape. We stood outside, my friend Vern and I, Vern Carson. Vern says, don't you have a ticket, you and Mary, where they include going to San Francisco? So what's up there? So he says, Ampex. Ampex. We get on the plane and go up there, and we go over to Ampex, and within 15 minutes of the meeting, it was a big yes. And that was when, when the whole world changed, and we said, okay, we're going to do that. 
a whole new art form opened up. One, the art of capturing things on 8-track and how to use the 8-tracks, because sometimes we only employed three or four. Well, hey, let's add, make this twice as big or add two more people singing on this thing. All of a sudden, we're overdubbing. We're going out of our gourds. We're crazy. Vaya 